Hello, my name is Tracy Mears. I'm a professor at Yale Law School, where I am also the co-founding director of the Justice Collaboratory. I'm here to contribute to a Coursera course offered by Johns Hopkins University entitled Reducing Gun Violence in America, Evidence for Change. Today, I'd like to share some information on the problem of unwarranted shootings by law enforcement officers and promising approaches to reducing such shootings. Unwarranted shootings are an important, yet sometimes overlooked, aspect of gun violence in the United States. Let's begin with establishing the fact that gun violence is a multifaceted problem in this country. While people focus on obvious aspects of gun violence, such as mass shootings in schools and public places or the kinds of street violence that has long plagued Baltimore and other cities, there are critical aspects of gun violence we ought to pay attention to in addition to these two kinds. Suicide, for example, is the most prevalent aspect of gun violence in the United States when considered on a daily basis. Accidental shootings and shootings of individuals by police are two other notable components. Shootings of individuals by police comprise a proportionately small percentage of the typical number of shootings on any given day. However, these shootings are nonetheless important because they are often number one, high profile, and that incidents are shared widely on print and social media, and two, because so many incidents become common knowledge, police shootings potentially are extremely undermining of the legitimacy of law enforcement when people understand those incidents to be and when they are, in fact, legally unwarranted. Since teenager Michael Brown was killed by Ferguson, Missouri police officer Darren Wilson in 2014, the public's attention has been fixed on the number of people killed by police each year in the United States. Various data sources indicate that in each of the years 2015, 2016, and in 2017, over 1,000 individuals were killed by police. Note that I said various data sources. As Nancy Krieger of Harvard School of Public Health and her colleagues pointed out in a 2015 publication, no reliable U.S. data exist on the number of persons killed by police, in part because of longstanding and well-documented resistance of police departments to making these data public. This lack of transparency around the data fuels a legitimacy deficit around policing and makes it difficult to determine whether shootings are warranted or unwarranted. When I use the term legitimacy, I am using it in a very particular way. Specifically, I mean to refer to positive theories of social psychology and not philosophical ideas. Social psychologists have demonstrated that people are more likely to confer legitimacy on authorities and laws, that is, people are more likely to voluntarily obey authorities and law, cooperate with them, and engage with them when they perceive authorities and law as fair. And these researchers have also determined that people are much more likely to come to conclusions about the fairness of authorities and laws when four factors are present. First, voice is incredibly important. And by voice, I mean an opportunity to tell your side of the story when you're dealing with an authority or have input into a law or legislative strategy or policy. Second, people care a great deal about fair decision-making. And by that, by that, I mean people care about the fact that decisions are based in fact, that are neutral and not biased, and that are transparent. Third, people care in their dealings with authorities about being treated with dignity, concern for their rights, with respect and with politeness. Fourth, people care in their dealings with authorities about being able to expect to be treated benevolently in the future. We call this factor trustworthiness. People want to believe that the authorities that they are dealing with believe that they count. And they make this decision by assessing how authorities treat them with respect to the four factors I just laid out above. From this summary of research, it should be clear how confusion and lack of transparency around the data regarding police shootings is extremely problematic for perceptions of legitimacy of law enforcement. 
Another pr major problem for the legitimacy of police directly related to the number of police shootings that occur each year is the fact that so many encounters between police and civilians occur when police respond to suspected nonviolent offenses. While available data show that many people who are shot by police are armed with some type of weapon, such as a gun or something else, it is also an incontrovertible fact that the number of encounters that occur between police and civilians is a function of the proliferation of criminal offenses, including nonviolent public order offenses, such as selling loose cigarettes from a pack on a street corner. In a world in which police in some jurisdictions are encouraged to engage in proactive policing of low-level, nonviolent public order offenses on the theory that proactive policing of such offenses can reduce violent crimes, it is necessary to ask whether the risks pertaining to such encounters are worth the crime reduction benefits that may obtain. The best analysis of such proactive strategies suggests that crime reductions are not very large and probably are not very long-lasting. In contrast, in addition to the potential loss of life, Eric Garner lost his life in the process of being forcibly arrested because he was selling loose cigarettes on a street corner in violation of New York City municipal law, several research studies indicate that being stopped multiple times on the street by police is associated with lower levels of perception of police legitimacy, actually being arrested in the future so that the police strategy is itself criminogenic, and increases in negative mental health measures. The next question then is what can we do to address police shootings? One prominent and increasingly popular strategy among policing executives is to mandate de-escalation training for members. The idea is simple. Slowing down dynamics during incidents gives an officer opportunities to diffuse situations by opening up space for her or the individual she is having an, an encounter with to make different choices. In order to have more available strategies to open up choices, it is important then that officers have training to address tendencies that are currently shaped by existing training and biases, especially implicit biases triggered under stress, to use more force rather than less in an incident. This de-escalation training and another popular specialized training module, crisis intervention training, which emphasizes special skills that officers should employ in order to deal with mentally ill individuals, have been prominent among reformers. There is very little evidence regarding the effectiveness of this kind of training, however. Compton, Bahora, Watson, and Oliva in 2008 suggested, and I quote, the training component of the CIT model may have a positive effect on officers' attitudes, beliefs, and knowledge relevant to interactions with such individuals, and CIT-trained officers have reported feeling better prepared in handling calls involving individuals with mental illnesses, end quote. A recent review of behavioral effects of this kind of training, however, by Peterson, reveals mixed effects. There is similarly little research on the impact of de-escalation training. However, a comparative frame is helpful for thinking about the value of these approaches. In European countries and in the UK, where this kind of approach to policing is commonly employed in situations in which individuals have deadly weapons such as knives, civilians are very rarely killed by police. In the UK, for example, in the years between 2005 and 2017, the number of pol people killed by police each year was fewer than five, excepting 2016 when the number was six. And at least two of those years in that period, the number was zero. Finally, another prominent recommendation that many police executives have begun to implement is to train members regarding the basic ideas of procedural justice I have outlined at the beginning of this short talk. The idea here is that if police understand their job differently, not as being a warrior against crime, but instead as being a guardian, or better yet, an agent of the community they have sworn to protect and serve 
dedicated to listening to their principals, the community, and carrying out their principals' goals and projects in the way those principals would like them to be carried out by treating their principals with dignity and respect and fairness, then the resulting changes in behavior by both police and citizens will reduce both interpersonal violence and incidents of the police use of force. Because I have little time to review the available research regarding evidence of procedural justice-based training for police on the use of police use of force and on police community relations more generally, as well as the available research regarding procedural justice and legitimacy-based violence reduction strategies, I will instead refer those interested to the Justice Collaboratory website at Yale Law School, which collects some papers, as well as the website for the National Initiative for Building Trust and Justice, which is at trustandjusticespelledout.org. There, those interested will find a number of resources and evaluations of the strategies I have mentioned here. Gun violence is a critically important public health problem that has many facets. One of those facets pertains to the ability of police to work with communities to address the violence people experience in their neighborhoods from each other. Another important facet is the fact that police are able to use force, violence, in the service of those ends. It was my goal here to explain the potential ways that such strategies and tactics potentially have harmful, violent consequences. We should work to address and minimize them. Thank you.